Hi, and welcome back to the channel. Today, I want to tell you about a story that recently came out in the world of cybersecurity that is almost beyond belief. This is a story about how the Chinese state compromised the back-end infrastructure of Microsoft and that allowed them to gain access to email accounts of the US and UK government. Now, compromising email accounts is, is fairly standard practice in cyber attacks, but the way the Chinese did this is really impressive and very sophisticated. Before getting into the detail though, I want to talk about how we know so much about this breach and what happened at Microsoft that enabled the attackers to get in. Well, the breach happened in 2023 and a US body which is sponsored by the US government called the Cyber Safety Review Board, which is made up of public and private sector individuals who are all specialists in cybersecurity, investigated what happened. They interviewed a bunch of people at Microsoft and at other organizations and published a really comprehensive report about exactly what happened and what lessons there are from this breach. So how did this happen? Well, I mentioned a minute ago that hacking email accounts is fairly standard fare in cybersecurity. It happens quite often. People can brute force their way in. They can try and socially engineer their way in by tricking someone to revealing usernames, passwords. They can bypass MFA or trick people into accepting MFA requests. MFA is multi-factor authentication, by the way. It's the alerts you get on your phone or text messages you get with codes in. And they're in addition to things like username and passwords. But the way this attack happened was nowhere near any of that. It was totally different and was super impressive. The way the attackers got access is all down to stealing something called a Microsoft signing account or an MSA key. And that allowed them total access to all enterprise and consumer email accounts, totally bypassing all those other controls. One of the crazy things about this story is that Microsoft don't know how China got hold of that MSA. They have no idea. Initially, they thought maybe it got stolen from their corporate network when it was exported in a crash dump from their production systems, but they just don't know. Interestingly, the MSA was actually from 2016 and it was only for consumer accounts. So what happens is this key is used to sign access tokens that can allow people to have access. Now, the odd thing here is it's obviously quite dated. It was used in 2023 successfully by these attackers. It was used for a period of six weeks before being detected and shut down. But it's quite odd that a key that old wasn't rotated or wasn't changed. And in addition, it was used to access enterprise email accounts, not consumer accounts. And the report talks about that whilst Microsoft used to manually rotate these keys, it caused an outage a few years ago and that stopped them rotating it. And in addition, due to some logic failures in their authentication mechanisms, it meant that although this key was only for consumer accounts, it could be abused to sign access tokens to enterprise accounts and therefore gave access to the email accounts that the Chinese state were able to get into. In fact, the really scary thing about this is that they could have used it to access any Microsoft Cloud email account. And that's bypassing all the multi-factor authentication. You could have had the best password in the world. You could have had amazing conditional access policies that made that access even harder. And this would have just breezed past all of it. Now, as I said, they only had access for six weeks and they used it to target very, very specific accounts in the US and UK governments, and I believe a small number of private organizations. And those are the accounts of people like the Chinese um, ambassador from the US um, and other people at the US State Department. And it was discovered by a really impressive bit of detection engineering where using a very specific log source only available to Microsoft premium customers, the State Department were able to identify that there was this anomalous access to their email. And that's what triggered a chain of events that identified that the MSA had been stolen, was being abused. So they only had access, as I said, for six weeks. Um, they were able to access tens of thousands of emails though from what was probably quite a low classification email system, but nonetheless, really sensitive emails. And I can't talk about this attack without showing some kind of respect or appreciation for the trade craft that the Chinese hackers used, not just to gain access to this key, but also to understand the Microsoft infrastructure to the level where they could steal the key and then also abuse it in a way that allowed them access to that email. In the report from the CSRB, it does talk about a previous breach where they believe 
Chinese hackers may have stolen documentation to do with the Microsoft infrastructure. And they think that's what they might have used to understand how Microsoft operated and therefore how they could abuse the access that they had. Now, if you've got time, I really recommend reading the CSRB report. It's a fascinating read. They interview some people really close to the issue. They ask some really difficult questions and they have some quite damning conclusions. I'm going to read some quotes directly from the report now because they're worth repeating word for word. The board finds that this intrusion was preventable and should never have occurred. The board also concludes that Microsoft's security culture was inadequate and requires an overhaul. And lastly, the board identified a series of operational and strategic decisions that collectively point to a corporate culture in Microsoft that deprioritized both enterprise security investments and rigorous risk management. Now that is damning for an organization the size and the sophistication of Microsoft that's meant to be leading the way in things like AI at the moment. And they can't even do infrastructure security properly. And they sit, and the report talks about this, they sit so central in our technology ecosystem. They've got so many customers, they're a huge organization, and they got this wrong. It's really good that folks like the CSRB exist, then we get this kind of public analysis or, or public scrutiny of organisations like this. And I really hope that it leads to change for Microsoft. But reading the report, it's quite a scary, sobering read of maybe the state of cybersecurity in some of our suppliers. So what do I think Microsoft should do next? Well, I think they've got to come out the gate swinging. They've got to come up with an incredible plan that they're gonna talk about publicly, about how they're gonna fix these issues and how they're gonna have a roadmap that's gonna address them at pace. Okta did something similarly uh, recently where they'd had a series of data breaches and attackers accessing their infrastructure and they came out with a plan of how they were gonna address it and they publicly said that the vast majority of their engineering effort for 90 days was gonna be solely focused on fixing those issues. Unfortunately, Microsoft haven't come out with any of that yet, so I'm curious what they're gonna do, but I think that would be key for regaining trust. I think another area Microsoft need to look at is how they charge a security tax. Now, you might not be familiar with Microsoft licensing. I personally find it quite complicated sometimes of which, which features sit in which license tier, which you can legitimately have access to, and what can they all do. But fundamentally, for their best security, you pay quite a premium. And sometimes you're paying that premium to secure insecurities that they've built themselves or features that aren't fully formed that you then have to go above and beyond to make secure. I find that quite frustrating. And I think Microsoft could have a massive win here by making more of that accessible to their customers. As I said earlier, this attack was detected by a custom rule at the State Department, and they were using data that was only available in Microsoft's premium license, their most expensive license. So that means that for the majority of firms, and I appreciate not that many people are probably worried about attacks by the Chinese state, there's no way they could maybe afford that level of license or the engineering expertise to detect it and build the detections themselves to find that kind of activity. It's really impressive engineering work from the State Department, hats off to them. But for the majority of us, that's just well beyond our reach. And indeed, it sits a bit uncomfortably that a data breach of the Microsoft backend infrastructure was discovered by one of their customers and not them themselves. So as always, I wanna talk about what the blue team lessons here, what can we as, as mere mortal blue teamers take away from this and learn from it? Well, I think one of the first things is transparency during a breach. The report highlights that some of the information Microsoft shared at the time was later identified to be wrong, but they didn't update that for a very, very long time. And when they did, they did it very silently, very quietly, not to uh, attract too much attention. And I think, again, that just erodes trust. So if you're dealing with a data breach and you're communicating publicly, I think transparency is super key. In addition to that, if we do have security incidents and they're public or they impact some of our customers or we have to do something about it, it's really, really important to spring back quickly, have that plan and start remediating the problems that caused the data breach or the security incident in the first place. There's nothing worse than hearing about somebody having a data breach than they're just being an apology and then a void of information. It almost sounds like they don't take it seriously or they're not doing anything about it. So that ability to turn around quickly, come back with a plan, address those deficiencies, helps again rebuild trust and make people happy.
Another one I took away from the Microsoft breach, and indeed was similar in the Office of Personnel Management video that I did recently, is the need to protect internal information. Now, most firms I've worked in are really good at sharing internally. So we have a SharePoint or a Wiki or whatever it may be. It's open, people can view stuff, infrastructure documents, design documents, all this good stuff that's really key to operating this infrastructure is available to a lot of people. That causes problems. The problem being that obviously an attacker wants to get their hands on that. They want to steal that. They want to learn about how an organization operates. What's the network look like? What's the infrastructure do? And in this case, because it got stolen, we think it was used to uh, facilitate this attack. So protect infrastructure documentation well. And then finally, I think the, the only other blue team lesson from this attack is how we use email. Now, this is a really interesting one because we do lots of smart stuff with things like multi-factor authentication, password strength, potentially conditional access as well, if you're familiar with it, to protect those email accounts. But often, and, and I think lots of us are guilty of this, email ends up being used just as a data repository, a store. There's lots of sensitive information in there. There's been some breaches recently where it's been highlighted within email accounts where passwords, other credentials, SSH keys, all just sitting there. That means if that account gets compromised, all that data is lost. And I know lots of folks who, if they're doing hiring, their inbox is also full of personal data like CVs, scans of passports, and it's quite irregular that folks go back through and remove that data. So I think there's an education piece for our users to not use email just as a dumping ground for data. And when we're done with email or we're done with the data within the emails to remove it. A great example is using sharing links instead of attachments. That's a good idea, of course. If a cloud account is compromised, it's probably compromised enough that it could also be used to view the data behind those links. But it's another barrier for those attackers to get to. So that's all for today. I wanted to keep this video quite short. There's loads of detail in the CSRB report. I really recommend if you found this interesting, I'll leave a link to it in the description. You go back and read this. It is a fascinating um, summary of what infrastructure looks like and security looks like for a massive cloud service provider and the lessons we can learn from it. I'll see you next time.